All right. We are looking for this course at the works of uh, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, not the entirety of their works, um, but uh, those related to the topic uh, or the theme that I've called science fiction and sub-creation. Uh, and with that, I am trying to address what I regard as a commonality of purpose and vision in the two men's works, the two men who were uh, connected not only in their fiction, but in their uh, vocations as academics, as medievalists at the University of Oxford for uh, many decades, and then uh, before Lewis took a post up at uh, Cambridge University. Um, but both of them seem to be in their writing dealing with, uh, for all of their interest in medievalism and for all of their uh, fiction, fictional um, endeavors, engagement with what we today often call fantasy literature, there's a, an element in which uh, the fiction seems to be very much contemporary in its um, application and in its relevance, for which reason uh, J.R.R. Tolkien uh, was voted in uh, the early uh, 2000s as the author of the century in Britain, much to the chagrin of the literary establishment in Britain. And I was there at the time doing my doctoral work uh, in uh, uh, romantic literature up at the University of Durham. Um, but it was interesting to me to note how popular, wildly popular, uh, the works of uh, Tolkien were, particularly when it was uh, evident also that his work was not even studied in the academy. And for all of his reputation as a medievalist, and that of C.S. Lewis for that matter, both men were uh, more or less ignored by the academy. And I find that uh, fascinating on multiple levels, also rather frustrating, it must be said. But fascinating because it, it seems to me that, uh, as in so many things, um, the uh, audience that both men have enjoyed, and that, that's evident in the uh, renditions of their works in, in film and so forth. But even in terms of the sheer of, uh, breadth of the readership that both men have managed to garner over the years, that there's something that they are writing here in this so-called fantasy or escapist literature, which nonetheless addresses issues that seem relevant uh, to uh, not only their countrymen, but to all those who are um, living and operating under the conditions of uh, contemporary life in the 20th century when they wrote, and now in the 21st century, that matter. Uh, and so I have offered this course for a number of years now, um, and looking at it uh, under the auspices of modernity and the particular challenges posed by it. Now, the challenges posed by it are largely those of uh, modern science and, and the use of technology. And uh, on the course, I'm going to address some of those broader uh, societal issues, uh, technological issues. I have a, a whole bevy of books devoted to uh, the technological society and so forth from uh, various authors. I will get into those perhaps uh, uh, in greater detail as the course progresses, but it is certainly to my mind clear that we're dealing with far more in the works of uh, Lewis and Tolkien than uh, a, some sort of uh, romanticist uh, medievalism, uh, which is one of the ways in which we can appreciate their literature. And of course, they themselves were very much uh, wedded to the medieval worldview, uh, a worldview that I will um, at least uh, briefly uh, uh, engage with, namely the view of the heavens in uh, Lewis's uh, work, The Discarded Fiction, The Discarded Fiction, The Discarded Image, um, here. Um, I don't have the, the cover uh, of that, but the v view of the heavens, which was uh, radically altered in the Renaissance period, and a new cosmology ensued. And with that cosmology, a shift in sensibilities uh, away from what we could call a classical universe and worldview to a 
uh, romantic uh, universe and worldview. And with that, a sense of alienation that ensues and an alienation that we can already see in the Enlightenment period in the 18th century. Uh, the uh, feeling of agoraphobia expressed in the fiction of the day uh, for the first time, uh, something that um, it appears that both um, the ancient world and even the medieval world would have found utterly baffling. They did not live with any sense that there was a nothingness or an absence or space around and above them. They had a very sense, strong sense that the heavens were um, in relation to them, pressing upon them, influencing their lives, and that everything, all of life was relational and ultimately relational to God who created this vast cosmos of things relating to one another. Uh, but in the modern period, that sense disappears and we get the sense of, um, as I say, space and emptiness with it, a void. Uh, and that void gets associated even with God himself who's often presented in terms of the real absence rather than the real presence. Um, so I will, I, will, I will touch on those issues and the consequent effect it has on sensibilities in the writing of the period. Uh, when I say the writing of the period, now I'm not just talking about the works of Lewis and Tolkien, but uh, beginning back with uh, science fiction in general. So I will look at uh, Lewis's will begin the course by looking at C.S. Lewis's little essay on science fiction, uh, which addresses the type of science fiction with which he is interested. Uh, and he's not interested in science fiction in general, but rather that type of science fiction, without giving it all away, which is particularly um, associated with what we historically would call fantasy literature. Um, in other words, the, the, the very same sort of literature that J.R.R. Tolkien is clearly uh, engaging with in his own work, uh, in particular, The Lord of the Rings. So uh, when C.S. Lewis writes his uh, science fiction trilogy or his space trilogy, depending on how you want to uh, frame it, he is engaging with science fiction, but he's doing it as a fantasy writer. And he's doing it with an apologetic uh, intent, namely to uh, question however implicitly and sometimes explicitly, the presuppositions of modern atheistic science fiction, which presumes the real absence uh, in its presentation of the uh, world outside of us. So we'll look at um, a couple of works there. As I say, we'll begin with Lewis's little essay on science fiction in our next class, uh, before then going on to uh, a classic work of science fiction, which is in some ways, um, not a work of science fiction proper, it's more of a gothic horror novel, uh, namely the work Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. And I'm going to look at this, and you can read this from various vantage points. It is read often as a form of gothic fiction, which it is, it's as, a, as a sort of a medieval setting. But it's also in the context of modern science and, and Prometheanism. Uh, the idea that, uh, and this is the subtitle of Shelley's work, Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. And, and Shelley looks at modern science in its Promethean uh, uh, aspect, uh, in the way in which it regards uh, mankind and human nature as something that it, it ought to take control over or gain power over. Um, and I'm going to deal with that theme a great deal. Um, in particularly in the work of, of Lewis, but we'll even reflect upon it a little bit in, in Tolkien's writing because he also talks about the creation of new beings and in some sense speaks to the um, transgression that ensues when things are broken apart and reconstituted by the, uh, the uh, wizards or leaders of our day. And so the theme of transhumanism will arise in the fiction beginning with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, but then also uh, going on uh, through um, the uh, science fiction of, of H.G. Wells. Do I have that here? Uh, not sure. But the, uh, the, the work, work we're going to look at is The First Men in the Moon. Oh, yes, I do have it. So it's a little picture from uh, this. H.G. Uh, Wells, The First Men in the Moon. And we'll get a sense from the classic 
science fiction writer Wells, uh, how he portrayed uh, the heavens and, and space and the sense of hostility uh, that was inherent in that portrait. Uh, it, to my view, this has a vast imaginative effect on uh, not only Lewis, which he testifies to in, in this little uh, essay which we, with which we'll begin the work uh, course on science fiction, but also the, the imagination in general and the view of how we, namely we being human nature, relate to the world around us and to the heavens above us, which are no longer portrayed as heavens, but rather as a void, a uh, spatial void, uh, ominous towards us, and nonetheless, which we are seeking to conquer and colonize uh, much the same as every other aspect of terra firma has itself been conquered and colonized. And so with this, we will be speaking to some degree about Baconian science uh, and the attempt to bring nature under our power, which begins with the natural world and ends with uh, human nature itself. And so to some degree, I'll be tracing the argument made um, more popularly by a man by the name of Roy Porter, an English uh, scholar, in his book Flesh in the Age of Reason, about how the Enlightenment transformed the way we see our uh, bodies and our souls uh, furthermore. And we will be arguing that what it does is a, it affects a sort of a Gnosticism in our view of ourselves, a return to Gnosticism. Now this thesis is not new to um, uh, the, ac the academy. Um, it's one that has been presented by theologians for some time now, Catholic theologians and Protestant theologians at that. There's a new sort of Gnosticism, which we can see in contemporary understandings of the body and gender and so forth. And these, these are, uh, as it were, Gnostic renderings of human nature, a self-fashioned humanity, which we ourselves are in control of. And that particularly includes our bodies, which are seen in some sense as distant from our souls and at the same time as an expression of them. So we'll look at these things. So there's a reconstitution of human nature and there is to some degree uh, a, uh, a deep engagement with the issue of what it means to be human in both men's works, in both Lewis's work and in Tolkien's work. So these are really interesting phenomena, profound phenomena, and they are uh, also as relevant in the time in which the two men wrote these works, the context of the Second World War, the eugenics movement, um, and the uh, vast experiments that were taken on human nature by the scientists of the day, not only in Nazi Germany, but also uh, in Britain and in North America and, and elsewhere. Um, and, and the uh, ethical issues that ensued from that, but also uh, the way in which this, the power which was power over human nature was being particularly exercised by uh, the cognoscenti, the scientists, uh, and that, that science and the alleged progress that would come at their hands was nonetheless coming um, at the expense of the humanity of their fellow human beings. And this is a, uh, so there's a dystopian element to that, uh, which Lewis uh, particularly identifies uh, and strongly represents in his science fiction, particularly the, the third book in his trilogy uh, entitled That Hideous Strength, which evokes the idea of a tower, a modern tower of Babel, um, this amongst the scientists, the theologians of the day, the clerisy, if you will, um, and, um, and is addressing many of the issues that seem relevant in 2021 with the uh, modern tech companies uh, and the globalist elite uh, and the uh, way in which they're solving our problems uh, seemingly uh, while at the same time um, enhancing our problems, it seems to me. So we will look at that particular theme. Uh, as I say, we'll go uh, begin with Lewis's little short essay on science fiction before going to Shelley, then going to H.G. Wells' First Man in the Moon. Uh, and then we'll come back to Lewis, and we're going to spend an extended, like a month or so, looking at Lewis's work. 
uh, having set the stage for here's what science fiction portrays, here are the, the, the general presuppositions of modern atheistic science fiction, and then we'll look at Lewis's rejoinder to that. And Lewis's rejoinder to that is found in throughout his corpus of writing. He will question the modern humanities departure from uh, uh, the idea of a rational human nature. Uh, and, and he does this in, in various works and various forms. One that I have already alluded to is the discarded image. And with that with that discarded image, it seems to me there's also been a discarded um, approach to the humanities, that of the liberal arts and the seven liberal arts, the, the, the trivium and the quadrivium. So it's not just that the uh, sciences are transformed, although we will look at that, the way the sciences have reconstituted themselves and re-envisaged what they are doing in their endeavors, but even the arts themselves. And so we'll look at one of his uh, works that's profoundly related to that. It's a little book on education called The Abolition of Man. But I'll, I'll put that work in the midst of other works. We'll look at a couple of his uh, shorter essays on different two kinds of equality and the weight of glory and transposition and his view of membership, all of which are uh, issues related to human nature and human personhood which is a category, by the way, that of personhood, which is a legacy of the patristic era uh, of Christianity and is a reflection of how human beings are a, bear the image of God, God being personal in his nature or tri-personal more correctly, um, is borne out in the fact that we, the fact that we bear the image of God means that we also are ipso facto persons. And what Lewis and Tolkien, it seems to me, in their uh, reversion or appeal to uh, natural theology and the idea of a common moral nature among all um, sentient uh, or at least rational beings uh, is the idea that we are uh, undermining the notion of human personhood and the sanctity of life with it. Um, and we do so often in the name of a more expansive, more inclusive notion of life. So we'll touch on the environmental movement and, and what is often called post-humanism, in which there is an equation between life in general and human life. And with that equation, there is a reduction of the specific, specificity and also the um, uh, sanctity of human nature. So... Uh, the green world, the world of, of, of trees and life in general of animals is not dignified by the, the, this equation drawn between that and human nature. Rather, as Lewis himself puts it, human nature is pushed down into the muck. That is the consequence of the, uh, the, the drawing of an equivalence between human nature and animal nature, as it were. So we'll look at that in those little essays, and we'll look at it in particular in, in the three science fiction works that Lewis writes, uh, Out of the Silent Planet to begin with, uh, then Paralandra, which is uh, the way I presented its Paradise Lost written in outer space on planet Venus. And then finally, uh, we will move to uh, that hideous strength. But between Paralandra and that hideous strength, we'll address that work I just spoke of, The Abolition of Man, which is really, rather than a fictional presentation of it, it's more of a critical and academic uh, engagement with the consequences of this departure from the traditionally conceived humanities towards the human sciences and what that entails. Uh, and Lewis is very ominous in his uh, view on the subject, and I think his concerns are, are well-founded. Uh, but we'll get to that when we get to it. Uh, at that point, and by that point, we're going to hit uh, March. So we'll spend the uh, January and February building the case for uh, science fiction and the backdrop against which both men write uh, before looking at the works of of Lewis, and then in March, we'll move on to uh, Tolkien. Uh, now, when we do that, we'll begin with some of his shorter works. 
before getting to the Lord of the Rings, which will be the vast majority. But we'll look at a poem uh, in this volume called Mythopoeia, uh, his view of subcreation, which is uh, entailed in that, uh, as well as um, his work on fairy stories, uh, and also a little, uh, a brilliant little uh, parable, as it were, called Leaf by Niggle. And again, dealing with uh, Tolkien's notion of subcreation. If science is pushing us uh, to alienate ourselves from our nature, how can a uh, fictional writer, an author, do something that is in some ways um, beneficial, life affirming, um, and positive, uh, uh, rather than participating in the same sort of um, desecration of life, which uh, Lewis and Tolkien both see in the modern world and its, its uh, love of machines and technology and all of the uh, analogies that it draws between advances in technology and advances in human nature, both of which they dispute and find ridiculous. So we'll look at those works and then we'll get into the, the famous uh, um, work of uh, the Lord of the Rings. So we'll begin with the fellowship before moving on to the two towers and then concluding with the return of the king. Um, I will try and deal with them uh, as best I can. We've got about nine uh, classes on the subject, so we'll deal with them not so much chronologically, although we'll do that a little bit, but more thematically. We'll talk about uh, topics that arise out of it. So we'll, we'll talk about uh, Tolkien's legendarium, so his broader um, uh, view of things before looking on uh, his how uh, Tolkien has been received by the critics and this tension that exists between uh, the humanities traditionally conceived as Lewis and Tolkien uh, express them and the that of the academy in general. Uh, we'll look at Tolkien's view of language, uh, which is very much uh, word-centered. Uh, and it's anyone who studied Tolkien with any uh, critical acumen whatsoever will note that for Tolkien, his study of literature is almost more than anything a study of language and the roots of language. Etymology matters to Tolkien, and he invents his own languages within the Lord of the Rings for his fictional beings. And that seems to be at least as much of an interest to him as the actual story itself. And what this reveals to us is um, <clears throat> the deep rootedness of all of Tolkien and Lewis's endeavor. It's an attempt. Uh, a scholarly attempt to recover uh, something that is already good, which is latent and inherent in the world that God has created, and then expressing that latency in new forms, rather than uh, creating something original and new and detached from the latent goodness. The goodness is there, it needs to be held on to. It does not need to be created ex nihilo, as if it were not there. Um, then we'll look at uh, the portrait of evil, which is one of the more fascinating aspects of the Lord of the Rings, the, the depiction of evil. Uh, we'll spend some classes on that, and we'll look at the transhumanism that I mentioned earlier in the eugenics movement, the eye of Sauron, what that uh, reflects, uh, the palantir, the seeing stones. These are technological artifacts, as it were. Uh, the mirror of Galadriel, the, uh, the ring itself, what are these rings and the ring of power? How do they, what, what does this symbolize itself? What is it actually? Much critical debate over this very topic. Uh, we will look at types of and forms of temptation as they exist in uh, Tolkien's Middle Earth, which for all of its uh, reference to mythological beings in the, in the deep dark past seems very relevant in, in its uh, concerns about uh, the temptations of modern life. And then we'll look at the means of resisting that, which uh, interestingly end up being very much in line with the traditional uh, cardinal virtues and even the theological virtues. So, so the seven virtues uh, that uh, the Catholic faith uh, holds up, we will find are expressed in Tolkien's work as means to resist uh, not to overcome, but to resist the power of evil, which uh, is all around uh, the company, the fellowship. Uh, and then finally, I think I'll probably talk about the film uh, adaptions of 
Tolkien's work uh, and what it what we gain from them and also what we lose from them. And I am most decidedly of the opinion that although we gain a little bit from it and I enjoy the films myself, there's also a great deal that has been lost along the way. So that's the brief overview of the syllabus and what I will deal with in it, as well as some of the topics and themes that uh, will be prominent <coughs> on the course. Uh, every time I've taught this uh, course, I found myself um, excited at the prospect, uh, not only because the, I enjoy the fiction, but because it really does cast a helpful eye on contemporary events and, and how we're to understand them. Um, I'll do what I usually do in terms of assessment. Let me talk about evaluation and assessment for the course. Uh, there will be two essays, um, one due at the end of reading week, so February 25th, uh, and one uh, March 27th towards the end of the semester, and we will conclude with the usual exam in the exam period. So three means of assessment. Uh, the course will be delivered online um, as per our uh, circumstances, and I much regret that. I think much is lost uh, through not being present with one another, although the technology is so good we can interact. But on that front, um, I'm afraid that I, I'm rather impeded. I'm wearing these uh, not as a fashion um, statement, <laughs> although uh, my wife thinks that they look all right. Um, but more, they have their blue light, blue light filtering uh, lenses because I suffered a pretty bad car accident back in uh, December and am still laboring with uh, uh, concussion symptoms and so forth. And this, uh, I'm told, will alleviate some of the problems with, with screens and blue light and all that sort of stuff. So this uh, problem with, with technology that Lewis and Tolkien speak of seems particularly uh, germane to my circumstances at the moment. So in terms of the delivery of these, I'll largely be pre-recording the lectures and, and we will watch them in class together. And, uh, and then at the end of that, I hope to be able to uh, discuss what I've said uh, in the pre-recorded version. Uh, and that way we'll at least have some interaction, but I, you're gonna have to bear with me as I um, just uh, deal with the, the new normal for me at the moment and see how that progresses as the semester continues. But I think that's more or less it. Uh, in terms of uh, secondary literature on the subject, there are a great deal of good works that have emerged in recent years. There are several uh, biographies that I recommend. I wonder if I can cast my eye around and actually find them behind me. Um, one here at least. Uh, this one in terms of a literary uh, biography I think is very good. The Narnian. Um, this is a, obviously in reference to uh, C.S. Lewis. It's called The Life and Imagination of C.S. Lewis by Alan Jacobs. An excellent uh, resource if you want uh, good readings of his fiction, which is what I'm more, most interested in. I'm less interested in the uh, the uh, biographical details about what Lewis ate for breakfast and when. Um, and um, I want somebody who's sympathetic to Lewis's Christianity and understands it. And Jacobs is a, uh, it seems to me, a very uh, a deft guide in doing that. Not that I agree with everything that he says, but that's irrelevant. It's, it's very useful. Um, there are other biographies of Lewis and Tolkien that I have read. Um, and I could uh, refer you to as well, and I've found them all uh, actually quite useful. Um, but, but still, I think as far as the literary uh, um, aspects of Lewis, this is the best one for my money. Um, in terms of Tolkien, um, well, I have again a variety of uh, works that I could refer to. This one seems to me pretty good, uh, Joseph Pierce. Uh, Tolkien, Man and Myth, uh, A Literary Life. Again, it's referring to the literary aspects of it. I think Pierce, uh, who's a Catholic himself, is, is sensitive to the, uh, the Catholic elements of his expression. 
um, which I think are important actually and not to be neglected. Uh, I think it's hard to read either men without seeing how deeply interwoven their Christian convictions are uh, with their literary expression. These are not divorced from one another. They are connected. Uh, you can appreciate either without being a Christian, but you can't understand it very well without being a Christian, or at least without understanding the importance of these things. These are not dispensable things to be set aside. Um, as far as other works, well, there's a whole slew of them that we could refer to. Um, Tom Shippey's work uh, is, is excellent, I think, because Shippey is also a medievalist and understands uh, Tolkien in his uh, mythology uh, and um, in terms of his uh, medievalism and his references to other works. Both men, um, if we knew the medieval period as well as they did, we would, we would find allusions all over the place and sources and myths that the authors themselves have uh, cleaved to and, and drawn upon in order for their own fiction. So they're less imaginative than it might appear, and they are more uh, trying to retell a myth that has already been expressed by others in, again, contemporary and rather different clothing. But it's, the, it's, it's similar stories being recaptured by the two authors. Um, I could mention more, but I'll leave that for now in terms of the secondary materials. But other than that, I think it's fairly straightforward and uh, anything else we can deal with in person when we look at this together. And I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you.